Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, thank you to the New York Times for inviting us and allowing us uh, a little bit of a forum here. Um, just to dispel any rumors, we are, don't consider ourselves to be heavy industry um, as IBM, but we consider ourselves to be part of heavy industry and working with and helping heavy industry. We all know we've reached a point of inflection. Uh, there is no uh, choice about what we need to do. So we know what needs to be done. And where we see our role in that is in using data. Data being the one resource the world is absolutely blossoming with. Uh, and uh, we're sitting on data pools that are expanding every single day. You can see it here at COP. You can see it everywhere. And as does heavy industry. But to turn data into information, information using AI into decisions, and then decisions into actions. That's where we see the value, and that's where we see it's really, really important to focus on making those right decisions. Why? Because in most of the journeys we're going to go on in the next years, we only have one decision. We don't get a chance to say, whoops, that was the wrong way to go. We'll have to make one decision, whether it's around decarbonizing, whether it's around sequestration and so on. So we need to make the right decision. And that has to be an informed decision. And we are very proud to be part of that with our various softwares, hardwares, and consulting to help. And we're working with some of the largest companies here to help those companies get those insights out of the data, turning it into information, using artificial intelligence to then drive and turn that into those decisions that hopefully and will make the difference. We've pledged to be neutral in 2030 as a company. We're well on that journey, but it's a different st story for heavy industry. It's a longer story, and it's a very interesting story, and I'm looking forward to the panel. So with that, I'd like to hand back and uh, say thank you for inviting us, and we're proud to be a sponsor of this event. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hi, my name is Declan Walsh. I'm the Chief Africa Correspondent for the New York Times. Um, I was previously based here in Cairo as a Middle East correspondent and before that in Pakistan. Um, I'm really excited actually to be hosting this event about what I think is an incredibly important, often neglected part of the climate conversation. Heavy industry contributes to about 40% of global greenhouse emissions, everything from asphalt and concrete to metals and shipping and aviation. The sheer size of this sector makes curbing emissions very difficult. And historically, industries like shipping and steel have opted out of the climate action conversation. But in recent years, progress has been made. And of course, this sector is going to be crucial in the next phase of the green transition, building the infrastructure that we're going to need. So how fast is the heavy industry sector moving, and what are the most exciting opportunities to accelerate change? Before we jump into our panel conversation, I want to bring up on stage an eminent scientist, Richard Harrington, Harrington, I'm sorry, who is a merit researcher at the Natural Museum History, uh, the Natural History Museum in London, who's going to help us to set the discussion. Richard, if you can join us. Thank Richard. you. Richard, from a scientific perspective, could you help us to understand the scale of the problem that we're talking about here? Yeah, well, I mean, it is, a, it is an incredible challenge because, you know, the, the move away from carbon actually moves us into the realms of, of re renewable energy, um, which in itself is, has great material demands. We're going to have to mine between now and 2050 as much copper as we've mined throughout history. And, but even the mining of, of, of the sort of fundamental materials like cement and steel and so on have got, got to increase because the infrastructure for the green economy is much more material intensive than the hydrocarbon based sector. So that's in itself a challenge. But then if we dig, dig in, those industries themselves have enormous challenges because they are large CO2 producers, as you've said. You know, steel production accounts about 8% of the world's CO2 production, the, the, the um, cement industry, 7%, and the chemical industry, not far behind. So those three together are you know, enormous um, CO2 producers. And decarbonizing them is, is the challenge which manufacturers are rising to. 
But, but there, are, there are challenges there of the rate at which that can be done, uh, particularly when you think we're going to have to increase production, say, for iron and steel, and at the same time reduce their carbon footprint. So there's enormous commitments from companies producing those metals. ArcelorMittal have estimated it's going to be about 40 billion for them to, to restructure to, with, with low carbon technologies. And um, so this is, this is definitely a, a, an amazing challenge for people. Yeah, heavy industries have been, as I said a moment ago, relatively late entrance to the conversation. Um, what's, what's driving them to enter it now? Uh, are they motivated by a desire to be good global citizens, or are there more hard-headed business decisions behind it? Well, I think definitely business decisions, because um, let's face it, raising capital for major projects now is going to be looking, you know, it's going to be dictated by the, the, the footprint of those industries. You know, a um, um, big one of those will be the carbon accounting. And so most, for example, a, a major mining operation will need capital investment. And, and so releasing that finance without uh, a challenging and, and, and reducing the, the, the the CO2 output will be very, very uh, detrimental to the industry. I think. What do you think, what do you say are, is the greatest or the top two or three greatest challenges facing this industry now as it tries to move towards net zero? Well, there are some intrinsic problems. I mean, the cement industry has a, has a major problem because their raw material is limestone, calcium carbonate. And turning that to cement, you have to take the carbon dioxide out of it. And, and of course, the, the way it's done in the past is to release it. Yet that can't be done. So for that product to be made, something has to happen to that carbon dioxide. So that in it is, a, is an enormous challenge. It's the same for the chemical industry. They, for plastics, they are using hydrocarbons, which, although the sort of scope one and scope two issues for those products can be handled, the scope three, what happens to that material downstream, it, you know, they've got to account for the use of that plastic by, by downstream. So intrinsically, those, the problem is that those like cement and plastics have that carbon inherently as part of their uh, construction. So there's always going to be that challenge. I think the steel industry, it's, it's, it's slightly different because there are ways of using hydrogen technologies that that can exclude carbon completely from that cycle, but, but other industries are going to have to move towards things like carbon capture and storage, um, because actually the rate of changes we need is so rapid that I think that we have to think seriously about using carbon capture and storage more widely for some of these. There are some problems with that. We know that it's been looked upon as a distraction, I think, People have said it's a distraction, but for the cement industry, it's not a distraction because what else are they going to do with their carbon dioxide? Um, it, it, it is a distraction if it's being used to mitigate the use of hydrocarbons, I agree. And so, but I think it's such a huge challenge here that carbon capture and storage has a place in this whole scheme, but not for every industrial sector. Uh, what's the horizon look like for technological answers to some of these questions? For instance, for the cement industry or others where there hasn't been an evident answer for carbon, other than carbon capture until now, are there new technologies coming online that give you hope? Well, we could, they're definitely reducing the amount of CO2 being produced. It's mitigating the, the current technology. But it is difficult to see what, what's the product that will replace uh, limestone um, and uh, the, uh, the raw material that will replace limestone and there's that inherent problem in there and we're going to have to accept that either we're going to use and stop using cement or we have to embrace the uh, things like carbon capture and storage for, for particular se sectors. Okay, I think that's a great place for us to move to the main discussion. I'd like to invite our um, two panelists onto the, our other two panelists rather, onto the stage, please.
We have seated in the middle Elizabeth Gaines, who is the CEO of Fortescue Metals Group from Australia. And on the far side, Morten Bo Christiansen, who is the Vice President of Decarbonisation for Maersk. Thank you very much. You. Um, and a quick reminder to you in the audience that if you have any questions for the panellists at any stage, please write them on the note cards that you should find on the, on the seats beside you, or raise your hands so that our runners can find you, and I'll try to thread some of those questions into our conversation as we go along. Um, Morton, building on the reflections that we've just heard from Richard, I wanted to start with a couple of questions about your perspective on the state of heavy industries today. Um, Maersk is one of the largest shipping companies in the world um, in an industry that produces 3% of global carbon dioxide emissions, almost as much as the entire continent of South America. In your opinion, what are the solutions that will lead shipping to a net zero future? Yeah, um, so um, yes, indeed, shipping is, uh, is one of the so-called hard to abate sectors. In fact, um, global supply chains or global logistics is actually accounts for 7% of all um, emissions. So it's not just about solving <laughs> the shipping problem. You also have the land side transportation. But, uh, but the hardest uh, part is the, the shipping sector, Sim not because from a technology perspective, it's actually not at all hard. It's just more expensive. Um, and uh, so, so I think the first thing it takes is that you as a company realize that you are part of the problem. <laughs> and, and then you need to decide whether you want to remain part of the problem or you want to uh, be part of the solution as well. Because you know, we, we, our company is, um, like you said, we burn a lot of fuel oil. Uh, we, have a, we emit more CO2 than the country that we are headquartered in. And uh, it's Denmark, so it's a small country. But, but nonetheless, that's a daunting uh, data point. Um, but it also means we can have great impact if we actually start to address the problem. And, and that, uh, that is what we have decided to do. And we have now set an ambitious that by 2040, so soon in only 17 years, uh, we want to be net zero across all our scopes and across uh, all our businesses. And the technology pathway is there. I mean, we have technology today. You can order a vessel that can sail on green fuels. Um, the problem is actually that um, at least until, well, still, uh, there is no market for the green fuels. Um, We've seen kind of a chicken and egg type situation where no one invested in the assets because there were no fuels, but then again, nobody were producing the fuels because there were no assets to consume them at the end of the day because it was seen as too expensive. And that's just kind of a deadlock where everyone sits there and pass around the monkey. And, uh, and, and so we've tried to break that chicken and egg situation, order the ships and put up a big sign that says, we want to buy some fuels. And uh, you know, it's, um, that's clearly the, the, the challenging part because uh, it needs to be made from renewable energy, and, uh, and, and the cost is just higher than for fossil. Um, what, what proportion of your fleet uh, is powered by hyd green hydrogen at this stage? So today, zero. zero. Uh, there's no, I, mean, it, I mean, today it's all fossil fuel, um, and, and you can buy some. Well, we do actually have a, a couple of percent that runs on biodiesel, which is a, a drop-in fuel that you can just put into the tank. So, so we have a couple of percent of our fleet that runs on that. Uh, but, but the challenge is really that there is no market for these green fuels. So that's what we have, I, I mean, and it's a year and a half ago uh, since we ordered our first uh, uh, green methanol vessel. And, and so far we have managed to sign up eight um, agreements with, with suppliers, but, but still, um, we still have a long way to go. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we also just last week, we, we signed an agreement with, with the Spanish government to, um, to, to develop projects in Spain. We have a similar one here in Egypt. Um, we simply need more money, more players, more projects, because this is a scale game. Um, and, but the, the good news is that we actually see a big demand from our customers. Um, many of, of the customers in logistics and in container shipping are facing all of us, uh, the consumers, and, and uh, increasingly, you know, there is an expectation that, uh, you know, if you're like a sports shoe manufacturer, you know, the consumer can you know, less and less ac accept that that sneaker is sewn up in Vietnam and then it has been sailed or flown across oceans and, and continents. Uh, so, so they have all set science-based targets and, um, and, and they need some solutions to reach their targets. So, so that's the positive news. And, um, and the way we see it is that um, we think we have enough customers that we can get started. Can they cover the entire green bill? Probably not. But, but we also feel uh, an obligation ourselves. Um, but, but we cannot get all the way through without a le level playing field. So, so we also 
trying really to lobby for actually just a, a price on carbon. I mean, give us a carbon tax, level the playing field, and then uh, you know, I will guarantee you that things will move faster. <clears throat> Elizabeth, if I could turn to you, Fortescue is one of the largest iron ore producers in the world, uh, yet earlier this year the company committed to achieve a target of real zero by 2030. No fossil fuels and no offset wherever possible. Um, that's obviously going to be a huge feat for a, a company that released 3.2 million tonnes of greenhouse gases last year. Can you tell me why the company chose real zero over the usual net zero? Um, and to repeat a question I put to Richard, you know, is this uh, driven by virtue or is there a hard-headed business decision factor behind it? Well, I think the, the reason that we've chosen Real Zero is because business, as usual, is over. I mean, in, heavy industry has an important part to play and we actually have a fully funded plan to decarbonise our iron ore operations by 2030. So it's not theoretical, it's not a, a target, we actually have a plan that we've announced. It's a 6.2 billion US dollar investment, which for our size and scale is a significant investment. But we, you know, we're developing the technology ourselves. We found that some of the, the original equipment manufacturers uh, are a bit slower. So we're, we're very ambitious in our goals. But we're not doing it, I mean, we're doing it because we are in a climate emergency and it is the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. This will actually save us from 2030, about 800 million US dollars a year, um, and by 2030, about three billion dollars over that this next period, this next eight years. So one of our biggest costs is fuel. We consume about seven, eight hundred million litres of diesel every year. So, and we've seen the volatility in this, in the security of supply and the cost of fuel. So for us, this is absolutely the right thing to do, both from a I guess an ESG perspective, but really importantly from a business sense, because in you know, the iron ore business, iron ore has an important part to play, as Richard said, in the energy transition and demand for steel. Um, but also we've got to look at our margins, we've got to protect those margins in the long term. And so this is, a, as I said, it's a fully costed plan. Our goal for scope three is 2040, um, but 2030 is real zero. We don't see any point in net zero. We actually think, we know we've got a plan. We know we can demonstrate to heavy industry that you can fully decarbonise. And the goal is to eliminate fossil fuels from our operations. And just to give it some perspective, we operate in a very remote region of Western Australia. This is not simply a case of plugging into a renewable electricity grid. We're, we're in a remote place. We need to find solutions. Green hydrogen will play a part. Um, battery technology will play a part. But we're investing significantly in installing large-scale renewable energy uh, and that will achieve our goal of real zero. What sort of reception have you had from your own employees? I think the company has about 15,000 employees. Um, how did they receive this announcement? And what have you learned about bringing a workforce along with you when you, when you introduce this kind of change? Well, we've always had a, a history of, you know, our culture is very strong. So we really empower our workforce. And, and, and uh, sort of 10, you know, eight years ago, we made the decision to fully uh, automate our heavy haulage fleet. So that basically means we have, we're completely driverless. And we had to take our workforce on that journey. So they're used to the innovation. And when we do it, we do it on a large scale. We don't just do one truck. We do the entire operations. Uh, it's all operated remotely from Perth, you know, thousands of kilometres away, no drivers. Um, and so we actually work closely with our team members. And it will change some of the core skills that they have. A heavy diesel mechanic will no longer be working on a a heavy diesel engine. So we need to retrain, reskill. It will provide job opportunities. But I think what's been really, um, really important with this is that the whole workforce has embraced this. In fact, we're attracting talent, um, and it's not just in our iron ore operations. We're also on a journey to transition to a renewable energy um, uh, supplier. So we we plan to produce green hydrogen. Uh, and we're finding that we're attracting enormous talent. So people are coming up with ideas. The workforce are motivated, they're engaged, they're really, uh, they, they see our goal and the fact that we're putting all of our energy and efforts into doing this with a sense of urgency. We're not saying let's wait for, you know, most others in the mining sector have a goal of 2050 and I think we all know, being here at COP, that that is simply too late. So we're finding the workforce are incredibly engaged um, and they're coming up with those ideas as well which help, you know, to help 
us with our decarbonisation journey. Do, do you find that sense of urgency is shared in the rest of the mining industry, the extractive industries in Australia? Uh, how much of an outlier are you in this approach? Uh, no, maybe to be a little bit controversial, I think there's quite a few boardrooms around the country where it's a 2050 target, net zero, um, because that's going to be somebody else's problem. So for us, 2030 is, is immediate. I mean, 2030 is not far away, and we have to invest the $6.2 billion. And of course, Australia has a very robust regulatory um, environment as well, so it's not as though we can simply install large-scale renewable energy without going through all the environmental permitting, the heritage approvals from traditional custodians. This is a, a journey that we're on, but we're doing it with that sense of urgency. And I would have to, I mean, I, I certainly, in, in anywhere that I'm speaking, I implore others to have that same sense of urgency because otherwise we're just kicking the can down the road. Uh, you, you mentioned green hydrogen. Morton, Maersk is, uh, as you mentioned a moment ago, pursuing green hydrogen for some of, its, of your container vessels. Why does that stand out as the viable fuel alternative for heavy industry in general? And um, I believe there's some you know, debate among scientists about whether green hydrogen itself is in fact uh, uh, not a, perhaps not even a net zero or even a low emission fuel. Do, do you, <coughs> are you convinced that that is the future solution for your industry? <clears throat> yeah, so again, it, it very much depends on, on which mode of transport you're talking about. Everything on land uh, it can and should be electrified uh, directly. That is by f also just from an energy efficiency perspective, by far the best solution. Um, and, and I think uh, for some of the, the, the shorter uh, vessel travels, you can also electrify it. But, but if you look at a large container ship, it, it, it weighs around 250,000 tons when it sails out, and it needs to cover uh, um, 10,000 Nordic miles. So... I mean, the batteries would take up uh, like 60 to 70 percent of the space of, of, on the ship, right? So, so there wouldn't be much space left. Um, and I think when you plugged it in in Shanghai and Rotterdam, I think you would probably see the lights dim a bit in <laughs> on the continent. So it's just with current battery technology, it is not a, a feasible solution. Um, so, so the the next best thing is is green hydrogen, and um, and we are still not there with the ships, at least the deep seas, so the long haul that we can use um, hydrogen in its pure form, so you have to put it on a derivative, either methanol or ammonia, um, and, uh, and the only technology that is really available today is the methanol technology. So that's why we are going with that, but, um, but I think we all know that uh, there's no magic bullet here. We're very open to uh, future um, uh, solutions, and, and uh, we are certainly not in love with any technology, only the ones that actually uh, solves the problem. So, um, and, and, but, but we have clearly made the decision that it, we're not going to build any oil ships ever again. Uh, because, uh, and I very much echo what you are saying here, it's, it's the right thing to do. Uh, I mean, we are all here at the COP, uh, but it is actually also, we think at least from a business perspective, the only right thing to do. It's safeguarding the future of the company. You mentioned employee engagement. I can totally uh, subscribe to that. I, I've never seen any initiative in our company that engages uh, the workforce more. Mm -hmm. So in the war for talent, this is a great card to play. You mentioned earlier investors or the big pension funds. They want to know what you are doing. Uh, with the customers, or at least some, I mean, it, it changes the conversation. So, so again, you know, it's just, um, honestly, we think it's kind of a no-brainer. But uh, it, of course, requires a bit of, of courage to, uh, you know, embrace the unknown and, and, and embrace the uncertainty. And, and I, I know Fortis you relatively well, and I really, um, I, I really uh, applaud your leadership. Uh, and you have a plan, but I, I mean, there's still uncertainty, right? And you need to embrace that, but, but, but you do that. But that's how it is with any change in business, right? I mean, that's just how businesses run. So the good thing is I think more and more companies are seeing it like that. More and more boardrooms are realizing that, honestly, they are not doing their job if they are not future-proofing uh, their companies. So, um, so, And I think that's why we see all this momentum building, and, and that is great news. <clears throat> Yes, I guess it's an element of de-risking the future as well by yeah. taking these steps. Elizabeth, could you just speak, speak briefly about the role that green uh, hydrogen's playing for in Fortescue, Fortescue's changes? Yeah, well, green hydrogen's going to have a very important part to play, but we're seeing green hydrogen as a significant export opportunity. So the demand is there. We already have demand from E.ON in Germany for 5 million tonnes of green hydrogen by the middle of this decade. So we're in the race to develop uh, green hydrogen. We think it's a significant export market for, but not only for Australia globally, because renewable energy isn't just in Australia, unlike iron ore, which tends to be centralised in the Pilbara region. We're building currently in Gladstone in Queensland 
uh, one of the world's largest electrolyzer, electrolyzer manufacturing facilities with two gigawatts per annum. So we're very much focused on green hydrogen, also for energy for our operations. Um, uh, electrification will play a part, but for storage purposes and for energy for our operations, we see green hydrogen playing an important role. Some of our haul trucks will run on battery electric, some will be on hydrogen fuel cell, um, but we also see that significant opportunity as the world demands clean, renewable energy. Uh, we want to be there front and centre as a supplier of green energy globally. Um, I, I've read a little bit about the distinction between green and blue hydrogen. Um, I don't know if uh, someone on the panel here would like to explain what that distinction is. And also for, the, uh, for Elizabeth um, and Morton, whether that's something you've considered. Richard, if you want to just speak to that briefly. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah I mean, there are forms of hydrogen. You, there's grey, there's there's blue and there's green and you know gray gray hydrogen is hydrogen produced directly from methane from natural gas and um it's it's not it's not really you know it's a, it's a a step in the right direction but it it isn't anywhere near a green hydrogen blue hydrogen is where that's you have co2 sequestration so that you use you extract the, the, the hydrogen from the methane but you you capture the co2 but green, hyd the green hydrogen is where you get di direct electrolysis, basically water. You need electricity and water, and you can produce hydrogen and oxygen. And if it's renewable energy, it's, it is totally green. Um, obviously, the infrastructure has to be built for it, but they're the three types. And obviously, green is, is the favorite color because it, it, it actually is totally decarbonized in its supply chain. Morton, some uh, shipping companies are using wind propulsion te uh, technologies on their cargo vessels. Is that a plausible solution for Maersk or for the industry, do you think? Yeah, so the wind assisted propulsion uh, is a great efficiency level, right? So it makes you, you know, get more out of your, of your fuel. But, but obviously, if you relied on the wind alone, I, I think um, the reliability of your cargo would be, would be uh, not really up to what customers would expect. So, so it, it, is a, it is a great uh, step, and when we look at our roadmap uh, towards what we want to achieve, it, it's in there, but, but it is, um, compared to some of the other efficiencies and the levers that we have, um, uh, it's not a big uh, part, but it is certainly a relevant one and, and a good one. It's a, it's a great business case, right? You save fuel, whether it is the green fuel or the, or the gray fuel, you, you save fuel also. So it's definitely in there, and, um, and uh, I think other uh, sectors of shipping can have more benefit from it because the thing with a container ship is there's not really a lot of there are containers everywhere, so we can only use kites. But um, but but it is in there and uh, and uh, it, it does make sense. But it's not uh, it's not the magic bullet, unfortunately. Elizabeth, I'd like to hear your views about carbon capture and storage. Um, in a recent report, the IPCC said that removing carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere is an essential element of meeting climate goals. At the same time. There's a lot of skepticism about the scalability of carbon capture, fears that people are relying on it too heavily. Do you see carbon capture and storage as a sort of get out of jail card for the hydrocarbon industry? Or is it a technology that we should be trying to develop and push in order to draw down carbon dioxide more rapidly? Well, we have pretty strong views on this in terms of it's, it's a technology that hasn't been proven at scale. It's actually failed on a number of occasions. So the risk, the economic risk, the risk of leakage, the, uh, the, the fact that you know, it can be used as justification for further um, investment in, in, uh, in fossil fuels, our, our view is that carbon capture and storage does not have a part to play. And I know Richard has a view that there are some industries where it has to, and, and, I, and I appreciate that, but I think as a... Uh, solution as part of this green energy transition at scale that doesn't have a part to play. What we have to focus on is real zero, eliminating the use of fossil fuels and actually achieving uh, that, that real zero emissions rather than capturing those emissions that will still need to go somewhere. So, I mean, that's, that's our view. Morton, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, no, I think for some industries it may be a last resort. Um, and, uh, and if you can prove uh, the technology, uh, you know, it, it can be, you have to look at what is economically effective as well. Um, but when we look at our own, um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not really a relevant, um, it's not a relevant lever for us. Uh, we really want to just transition away from fossil energy altogether. Um, staying with you, Morton, some industry groups and coalitions have formed, uh, so a number of coalitions have formed to drive 
uh, full sector transformation, such as the First Movers Coalition that was announced by John Kerry last year, and which was in the news again this week because cement and concrete have joined it. How meaningful are these coalitions really? You know, they make a lot of noise sometimes at, conf at events like the COP, and then they seem to fade from the headlines very quickly afterwards. Do they really work? <laughs> Well, you know, there are many coalitions and this, that, and the other, and announcements being made. Most uh, don't really uh, amount to much action. I think the first mover coalition is actually an attempt to create a bias coalition, to actually put a demand signal in the market. So, so I actually think that that, that, that could well be an exemption. And, and we, are, we have actually we've signed up for it and, and, and are, are part of it. But of course, it, it, it needs to go from just having an intent to putting real demand in the market, right? You, you, I mean, getting, putting some dollars on the table. And, uh, and it needs to happen now because I mean, there is an urgency here. And for most, if even the hard to wait, I mean, the technology is here. And if, if you put down the investments, if you put the demand out there, it'll happen. That, that's how the world goes. So, um, you know, I, I really hope that these collisions will go into actual real commitments to real buy X percent next year, not, you know, 10 years from now, but now because. We all know this is a budgetary problem, right? There's only so much carbon left we can emit. So uh, we need to get started. And, uh, but I, I do think the First Movers Coalition uh, could be one of those that actually turned out to be, uh, to be powerful. Meaningful. Yeah. yeah. Elizabeth? You know, I, I would agree, absolutely. And I think even in the last 12 months, um, we've seen that you know, the dialogue this year at COP around green hydrogen. Last year, there was a lot of skepticism and it was a proven technology. Now it's becoming part of the... Um, the, the dialogue of, of being part of the solution, and, and that's because there has been a lot of work done by organisations like the Green Hydrogen Organisation to develop the Green Hydrogen Standard. So we do need these coalitions and these groups to actually help you know, uh, form these standards so that we're all working towards uh, similar goals. So I think I would totally agree. And some, some will be successful, some I think are very important, including the First Movers Coalition, as I said, the uh, Green Hydrogen Standard, because the amount of discussion at this COP around green hydrogen compared to a year ago, uh, you know, it's just changed exponentially. I, I guess I'm just wondering from the perspective of national governments in signing up to these coalitions, whether there are any real political stakes for them. I mean, is there any sense that in Australia or other countries, uh, it's easy to sign up to these coalitions, but, you know, there may, there may not be much follow through afterwards. Are there, is there pressure, for instance, in Australia from stakeholders like yourselves or from others in the government to take one position or another or to follow through, push through on these commitments? Well, we've had a change of government in Australia this year and, uh, and there's been a welcome uh, change in terms of Australia having a more ambitious commitment to emissions reduction, not necessarily uh, as ambitious as, for example, we would like and I think as industry we have an important part to play working with government. Um, and as I said, the regulatory environment is critically important for us to achieve our goals to decarbonise. So it is important that we engage with all of our stakeholders, including government, uh, and we'll continue to advocate for uh, more am ambitious ag agendas. Um, I guess a little bit unlike Europe, who's obviously facing some major energy, uh, a major energy crisis, we still have our challenges on in Australia, particularly on the east coast of Australia, where a lot of the uh, uh, the gas is actually exported. So there is this issue now where we're seeing those, those soaring costs of energy. So it's a very topical issue in Australia. Um, for us, we're getting on with it. Uh, we're very, we engage regularly with government, but getting those policy settings right will be critically important. So we, we need to continue to engage. Um, Fortescue's emissions are largely scope three emissions. Uh, indirect emissions that aren't created by your company, uh, but driven by your activities, everything from transportation to even business travel, I believe. Um, what would you say to further regulation being laid down for the management of those uh, scope three emissions? Well, just to give it some context, uh, last financial year, our scope one and two emissions were 2.2 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. Our scope three were 255 million tonnes, <laughs> and that's the steel industry and shipping. So I'm hope hoping Morton finds the uh, solution for <laughs> shipping. And we're working on that as well. Yeah. Um, but for the steel industry, steel will play an important part in the energy transition. And iron ore is obviously a core ingredient in steel making. So we're working with our customers. We do have a goal for um, uh, zero scope three emissions by 2040. So we're working closely with our customers on the future of green steel. That will include more direct charge material, 
uh, green iron, um, replacing the you know, glass furnace technology with uh, green hydrogen. So there's a lot of work underway. And we know that our customers, um, because we see in China in winter, there's a lot of production um, curtailments because of the emissions uh, profile in winter. So there's a real um, drive to actually reduce emissions. Our goal is to work with our customers to see whether we can actually eliminate emissions. But you know, we're, we're on that journey, but scope three is a very important focus for us as well. Um, at this stage, I'd like to open up for audience questions. Um, I, uh, I don't believe actually we had any cards in the room, as I said earlier, but we do have mics going around. So if you want to put up your hand, uh, one of our runners will go to you. Just over here, please. Yes. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Declan. Um, I would like to ask regarding uh, industries um, advancement. Are you part, and I apologize my ignorance, but are you part of a sectorial dialogue as well um, in each of your industries, Elizabeth and Morton? And also, how can people in the same industry, let's say in a different continent, can learn from the advances that you are creating, particularly the investment that you have put into? Um, is there more of a, a, a platform of dialogue? I, I mean, you've just said that in Australia there isn't such support within the whole industry, but maybe partnering up with more people globally that do want to lead or that want to follow and, and they don't have the resources. Like, how can we enable more of that industry advancement? Thank you, in both cases. I, I can, um, and, and, and if there's a, a, a website or anything where we can read more mm -hmm. of the kind of things you're doing that can be emulating as possible solutions for others to understand better, thank you. I think the way I understood your question was, are there any sort of sectoral forms for this where we as an industry discuss? Um, certainly for, for shipping, that's actually a, a, that's an industry which is regulated under the United Nations, under the International Maritime Organization. So indeed there is for, for shipping. And, uh, and that's very powerful because it means you can actually regulate the industry. The, the problem is it's a, it's a UN body, so everyone needs to agree, and, uh, and everyone doesn't. So, um, so right now the ambition level at that is way too low, um, uh, and, uh, and I think a lot of shipping company actually wants uh, the IMO uh, to step it up. Um, and uh, let's see what happens. Uh, but, uh, but for now, the ambition is clearly too low. But there is this form, and, and we have seen uh, in 2020 there was regulation around sulfur emissions that were implemented extremely effectively overnight, basically. Um, so so that, that is the power that this organization has. So we are really hoping and lobbying very much for them to sharpen the rhetoric. And, and again, what we're asking for is very simple. Give us a carbon tax, level the playing fields, and then, uh, and then we will get going, and everyone will get going. So, um, so that's at least how it is in shipping. The rest of, of logistics is extremely fragmented, very uh, regional businesses, so, so, there, so there are less of that. Um, mining? Yeah, look, I think with mining, um, you know, in the past, any major technological development is something you want to keep for yourself because it's going to give you a competitive advantage, and that tends to be how we operate. But I think with, um, with the climate crisis and the work that we're doing, we're actually developing the technology to be shared because we know that this is going to be critically important. Um, so this is less about what can we do to be give us a competitive advantage, it's what can we do to actually demonstrate that heavy industry can decarbonise, can reduce reliance or eliminate reliance on fossil fuels. So, so we will be sharing that technology. The forums, are, it's unlike the IMO, the forums are, are, are less... I mean, there is the, there's an, into the ICMM, which is International Mining... Um, but the forums don't sort of tend to focus. They, they focus on other things like tailings um, dam management and the like. So, but we do engage with industry. We engage with other manufacturers. The technology will be made available because it's going to be critically important to decarbonise. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? I think we're almost out of time, but we'll take one more quickly, please. Um, there's someone here in the front row, I think. Hi, um, I was just wondering what limitations you guys found um, that came from the use of hydrogen, such as um, the continued use of methane in gray hydrogen and the flammability of hydrogen. And then also, how does the competition of green hydrogen impact the global South's ability to use this new technology in their green energy transition? Okay, so 
I heard you mention the, the methane problem. I think that's actually only a problem, as, as Richard explained, if you do gray or blue. If you do green hydrogen, you don't, there is no methane. Uh, you only have water and renewable energy. Uh, so so if, if you stick to that version of hydrogen, I, I think uh, it, it, it shouldn't be a problem. And then, and then I think to your, um, uh, to your question around the opportunity this presents for the Global South, I think it's a huge opportunity. Um, I think, as I mentioned, we, we signed an agreement here in Egypt. Uh, this, this government, is, is, I think, sees tremendous opportunities for the country, job creation, income for the country. Um, and, um, and, and actually, uh, in, the, in the IMO, uh, uh, what we are hoping is that the, that the carbon tax will actually be used to uh, actually be channeled, not uh, back to the industry, but actually back to, to subsidizing, for example, production of green fuels uh, in the Global South, but of course also to some of the states that are more impacted by, by, glo by global warming than, than others. So, so um, I think if, if, if the world uh, plays its card well, I think this can turn off as a great opportunity for, for a lot of the countries that are actually suffering the most uh, in this emergency. But it does require that the world plays its cards well. So, so it, it's not going to happen by itself. Um, but, but there is definitely opportunity. I don't know if... if uh, Did you want to come in, Richard? Well, I just think just one thing to say, it's quite an exciting time because it's such a, a revolution that the, the actual people, the controllers of energy production could change very rad radically and we could decentralize it because of this this um, this revolution you know as Elizabeth was saying you know they're looking to produce their own energy actually places like Africa are an enormous potential to to be the new energy power hub yeah. because of you know solar and wind and so on and so we need to grasp those opportunities distribute the production of these things more widely which will reduce risk in supply chains, and it's to everybody's benefit to have that distributed rather than concentrated. And uh, so we should be grasping those opportunities yeah. to, mm. to reduce risk in, uh, you know, in the future energy production. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we've unfortunately come to the end of what's really been a fascinating discussion. I wanted to thank our three panelists, um, Richard, Elizabeth, and Morton.